This morning, we are proud to welcome our commencement speaker, Mr. Dean Baquet, Executive Editor of the New York Times. Mr. Baquet serves in the highest ranked position in the Times newsroom and oversees the New York Times news report in all its various forms. Before being named Executive Editor, he was Managing Editor of the Times. A, Pul a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, he previously served as Washington Bureau Chief for the paper from March 2007 to September 2011. Mr. Baquet rejoined the Times after several years at the Los Angeles Times, where he was editor of the paper since 2005, after serving as managing editor since 2000. It is my pleasure to welcome Dean Baquet. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> I can't tell you how honored I am to be the speaker for this class of Report for America for a lot of reasons. First off, as someone who grew up in local newsrooms and treasures them, your mission inspires me. What does it say on your website? Report for America is looking for, quote, talented, ethical, insanely hardworking, gutsy, open-minded journalists. That may be the most succinct definition, definition of the qualities of great journalists I've ever seen, and I plan on stealing it. But mainly, I'm jealous. I'm gonna use this speech to rewind my own clock, if you will indulge me. I've spent a big chunk of my career where you are, working in local news, covering cops and courts. I actually covered federal, state, and local courts all at the same time in New Orleans, racing from building to building, accumulating parking tickets, all the while looking for scandals to uncover while filing three, four stories a day. I started working as a journalist in New Orleans, the city I grew up in, but I found there were parts of it I'd never been to, didn't comprehend. I will confess that the first fire I covered, I got lost along the way, and the fire was out by the time I got there. I had to reconstruct it from neighbors, rising flames and all. I spent years on the craft of making sources, even among people I didn't particularly like. To be honest, it was the most exciting time in my more than 40 year career in journalism. I love journalism in all of its forms. In fact, after all these years, I remain giddy in love with stories, big ones and small ones. And I can sit for hours listening to reporters talk. I love reporting the most. Some of the greatest fun and the most profound moments of my life have taken place with a notebook in my hand. In fact, that's what I'd like to talk about today. One of the major crises in our profession, one I hope and pray you can help alleviate, is the erosion of the primacy of reporting. There are other issues, of course. There are many dyspeptic journalism professors and bloggers who will regale you with all the problems of the profession. But there's not enough talk about the beauty, the sheer beauty of open-minded and empathetic reporting and the fear that its value will fade in an era where hot takes, quick analysis and riffs are held in such high esteem and where many journalists seem to have no use for the quotation marks on their keyboards and where the capital I on those same keyboards seems worn out. The dramatic drop in newsroom jobs has been widely discussed, particularly in local news, but it's worth restating it for nothing more than shock value. Don't worry, this is not gonna be a downer speech, I promise. <clears throat> Between 2008 and 2019, newsroom employment in the US declined by 23%. At least one study asserted that newsrooms cut another 11,000 jobs in the first half of 2020. Everyone agrees the decline is worsening, worsening and that the cuts are taking place at traditional news organizations as well as non-traditional news organizations. This is a profound and serious threat to our democracy. But I actually think it's only part of the story. There's also the simple fact that news organizations have many more crafts than before, and most of them do not involve reporting. The product organizations and audience editors who've joined newsrooms in recent years are all journalists. They're vital to our futures. They save the New York Times and other American news organizations. In fact, we need more journalists taking on those roles. But these changes also mean that the average newsroom 
has even fewer reporters than the numbers show, fewer people on the ground, fewer people making phone calls, fewer people banging on doors, fewer with empty notebooks, desperate for explanations and answers. So the focus of my talk today is why reporting matters, why it should be restored to the center, and just how honorable and wonderful it is. Because I knew this was the season of speeches I've spent the past few weeks talking with reporters, <clears throat> collecting their stories, their surprises, their triumphs, and their lessons. I asked them to join me in reveling in reporting by telling me how they've been surprised, how they've had their premises tossed aside or had conventional wisdom proven silly, even how they chased a tip or a feeling in the gut. Prove to me, I asked several colleagues, that reporting is as valuable as I believe. As Jason DeParle, my former Times Picayune colleague, who is now the New York Times' great chronicler of poverty in America, put it to me, the great lesson of reporting is that the world is almost always more complicated and unlikely than it seems while sitting at your desk. I asked Jason what it surprised him in a career in which he has written about poverty and deprivation around the globe. He recalled a time in the 1980s when he covered the death penalty for the Times Picayune in New Orleans. One day he drove deep into Cajun country to interview a man named Godfrey Bouquet, whose teenage son had been murdered by a man who was about to be executed. Bouquet wanted his son's killer to die. Jason didn't believe in the death penalty himself. He expected to find a bitter, angry man holding fast to a barbarian view. He had caricatured Bourquet and surmised how hardened and vengeful he would be. But Jason got a surprise. He found a devout Catholic who was raising an adopted disabled baby whom he called God's special angel. What Jason said when I spoke to him a few weeks ago is, beyond whatever I wrote for that piece, the encounter made me listen harder and more fully to avoid stereotyping. Sometimes you notice stuff in the field, Jason said, that doesn't make it into your reporting, but still alters your perspective in an important way and makes you rethink your broader line of coverage. Melissa Segura Buzzfeed, who won a Pope for her series on Chicago's broken justice system, learned one of the most valuable lessons of reporting. Just get out of the office and go to the story. She sat in the living room of a woman who she believed had been close to a bad cop she was profiling. She showed the woman a picture of the officer. The woman looked for a second, then said she wished she could help, but she didn't know the man. Just then, a young girl in pigtails ran into the room, saw the photo in Melissa's hands, and shouted happily, Grandpa! Melissa turned to the woman and gently asked if she would like to start all over again. For the same story, Ms. Segura sat in the Cook County's clerk's office, where I spent many hours myself when I worked for the Chicago Tribune. She read through the more than 50 murder files. Her eyes were blurry. She had read every file, when one she felt was just tangential turned up. Exhausted, but with the good reporter's urge to know everything, she opened that one too, and found that the police officer's confidential personnel file had actually been placed into it. My point is that great reporters out in the world looking for stories make their own luck. Jody Cantor, part of the New York Times team that won the Pulitzer Prize for the stories about Harvey Weinstein's abuse, learned not to assume who the good guys and bad guys are in any story. David Boies, the super lawyer, the righteous slayer of dragons, turned out to be one of Weinstein's biggest protectors. Cameron Barr, acting editor of the Washington Post, told me his paper learned the value of continuing to report and report in the face of denials when they set out to prove that National Security Advisor Michael Flynn had secretly discussed sanctions against Russia with the country's ambassador. This was one of the big gets of the early Trump era. Flynn strongly denied it. They did more reporting and came back. This time he said he couldn't remember. Then they did more reporting and came back again. And then Flynn's team 
asked if they could withhold the initial denial from the story. Sometimes trust in reporting comes from such relentless pursuit of the truth that the subject has to admit you're right. My last example comes from the events of last year when American cities were the scenes of protest following the deaths of black men in police custody. This is John Elgo's story about the days after the death of George Floyd when the cry of defund the police was in the air. On social media, the debate was raging. Everyone was certain of their position. Certainty, by the way, is one of the enemies of great reporting. John, meanwhile, stood on a street corner in the predominantly black north side of Minneapolis, where one scene, one discussion, showed the true complexity of the issue. He wandered up to a group of people in fierce debate. Some thought there should be community patrols, not police. Some wanted money diverted from police to social services. One woman wanted police in her neighborhoods so they could stop cars from racing, but she was also wary of them because they had falsely arrested her husband outside their own house. As John put it to me, if you only talk to experts or advocates, it's impossible to get the nuance and even the ambivalence of the debate. Great journalists listen. When I was a reporter for the Times Picayune, I aligned myself closely with a police reporter <coughs> named Walter Philbin. He taught me if, that if you show some humility, genuine humility and some humanity, genuine humanity, people will talk to you. I recall standing with him outside the house of a woman whose son had been murdered. It is one of the hardest jobs of a reporter speaking to someone who has undergone a great tragedy. I was afraid to go in, I'll admit, afraid to intrude on their sadness. Walt, with great humility, said to her, and he meant it, that he wanted to tell her story, but only if she wanted to talk. Without her, he said, the story would only be told by police and the world might want to hear the fuller story of her son and his life. She invited, her in, invited him in and he told the story just as he promised. Every one of these reporters went in with an open mind and an open notebook. It is remarkable how many unbidden use the word nuance. They were not objective. Let's make one thing clear. No one is totally objective. Jason DeParle went in with his own views of the death penalty. I oversee coverage of law enforcement with a history of being a black man from the South whose father told him to always slow down when you see a police car and walk, never run. But they were open-minded. They went in looking for reasons to doubt their own conclusions. Each one of them was open to having their assumptions proven wrong. To my mind, that is a good one-line definition of independence and fairness. A great reporter is always open to being proven wrong. At its best, journalism is the process we have built to come as close to the truth as humanly possible. We should be open to challenges to that process. We should be humble about its limitations. We should learn that each generation will want to question it. One of my favorite quotations that I use often is from Bill Kovic, the former DC Bureau of Chief of the New York Times and former editor of the Atlanta Constitution. Bill said, every generation invents its own journalism. The best reporters I know go out into the world, turn off social media. They're open-minded and empathetic. They test their beliefs. They don't look for affirmation. Great journalism is skeptical of absolute certainty. Of course, I don't mean they're skeptical of the existence of racism or poverty or climate change. And of course there is right and wrong and we should call them out when we see them. What I mean is that these reporters did not see themselves as cheerleaders for anyone and that even the best ideas are worthy of interrogation. Thank you for letting me speak today. You're doing important work. Enjoy it. Savor it. Don't let ambition and the hunt for the next thing keep you from enjoying the doing. Local news is vital to the country. 
It is where the most important work is being done. It is a laboratory. Seize it. My life in journalism has been a full one. I grew up in a house with no books and got to travel the world. I'm inspired every day by the importance of what we all do. Undeterred by the critics in politics and even in our own ranks who spend too much time critiquing and not enough time making calls and talking to people. This life in journalism, I can promise you as my career nears the close, is fulfilling. You will have heartbreak for sure. You will work for institutions that will close. You will work for institutions that will reopen. You will get to transform the profession. And along the way, I promise you, this I can absolutely assure you, you will have more fun than anyone should and than any of your friends. Thank you.